This week, find out what hyperbaric therapy is for. It's worked wonderfully. We've just finished 60 dives. And meet a 17-year-old national track champion. Plus, an update on the development of a Kitchener subdivision. One of the unknown things was the industrial lands that are adjacent to it uh, are a gravel pit. Well, gravel pits are loud. I'm Allie Sewer Payton. And I'm Megan Spotswood, and welcome to Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. A new subdivision has been approved in East Kitchener near Lackner Boulevard. The construction will mean a lot of changes for residents who live near the site. Spoke TV's Michelle Ramos has the report. April 25th marks the day that City Council will ratify the Sandra Springs subdivision approval. City Council voted yes in a unanimous decision on April 11th for William J. Guy's construction to go ahead with their proposed plan, after hearing from various people involved, including residents in the area. The original draft for the new subdivision, located at the intersection of Lackner Boulevard and Keewatin Avenue in Kitchener, was approved in 1995. However, 21 years later, nothing had been built on the land. The planner for the subdivision, Andrew Head, explained the many reasons it has taken so long to turn the draft into a reality. One of the unknown things was the industrial lands that are adjacent to it uh, are a gravel pit. Well, gravel pits are loud and they were not in compliance with the ministry's sound levels, so we had to deal with them for over, over two and a half years to get them on site to bring their site into compliance so that we could be able to build houses. Over this length of time, residents of Dunnigan Drive and Knollwood Court, whose backyards faced the mature trees, had some reluctance to the damaging of the natural environment. The home you see behind me is currently the only residence sitting on the dead end that is currently Knollwood Court. Soon, 13 homes will be placed in the area. Councillor Scott Davey says he was happy with the proposals brought to Monday night's meeting as protecting mature trees is important to the city. To be frank, it's difficult for any politician today uh, that advances to this to, to any sort of uh, political stage to not really have a strong environmental sense. So whenever we hear trees are going to come down, it rings all sorts of alarm bells. After Monday night's meeting, it seems even the residents in the area are satisfied with the proposed changes, which includes split zoning and a smaller commercial plaza. City Council is still unsure if bus routes will be affected. For Spoke TV, I'm Michelle Ramos. With a budget potentially well over $50 million, the future Cambridge Multiplex location has been the subject of much debate. One petition to change its location has received hundreds of signatures. Spoke TV's Justin Emanuel has the details. After being discussed for over a decade and with the final designs to be approved this Monday, the City of Cambridge will likely be building a new multi-purpose recreational center on the Conestoga Cambridge campus. Not everyone, however, including Derek Coleman, a former member of Cambridge's Environmental Advisory Committee, believe the location is in the city's best interests. It's contrary to the guidance that we have from the official plan document, which is a, a binding document approved under the Planning Act. Coleman cites, among other things, transportation, zoning, and environmental issues with the project as it stands. Despite this, Conestoga's Vice President of Student Affairs believes there are benefits to the location. We believe that will help us in the longer term with our recruitment and things like that and attracting students. We want the opportunity for our students to be able to get uh, real-life work placements. Task Force Chair Councillor Montero says the cost of acquiring and cleaning the land of other potential locations, known as brownfield sites, would be too expensive for the project to move forward as needed. So you take 26 right off, the, we don't have enough. What are we going to put in it? You can build it. What are you going to put in it? You can make a shell with that money. Despite some concerns, the project will still be moving forward, with construction beginning in 2017 and doors open in 2019. This is Justin Emanuel for Spoke TV. With popular streaming networks such as Netflix, Show Me, and Crave TV gaining more and more popularity, cable companies are feeling threatened. Spoke TV's Matt Howell takes a look at why mainstream cable companies are losing business. In today's world, people seem to want to choose how and when they take in content. 
Cable and satellite providers are finding it increasingly harder to keep customers coming back. New options for streaming, such as Android and Apple boxes, as well as streaming sites like Netflix, have forever changed the way we watch TV. Sam Pell used to have cable, but made the switch to streaming a few years ago. As we watched it less and less and less, by the time we moved into our third place, we just decided not to get cable when we got to this house. And uh, it's worked out pretty good. We've gotten a few other things in its replacement. And I mean, definitely part of our qualm was the cost of cable. It went up every year, $10, $15, depending on what you wanted and what stations you wanted to watch. So we went with Netflix originally, which was pretty awesome. According to the Convergence Consulting Group, 190,000 Canadians cut ties with traditional TV in 2015. That was an 80% increase from the year before. Cable and satellite providers are coming up with new ways to try and keep existing customers or entice new ones to come aboard. Basic cable packages as low as $25 a month, as mandated by the CRTC, is one idea to get people back on cable. Jeff Fisher, a cable user, discusses why he got cable originally. Cable. Being old school, we've always had cable. You start off having cable, and it was the only way you could get TV, so we just continued with it and just actually kept increasing our package as more became available. Fisher also discussed what his future plans are with cable use. Probably not. If I do keep it at all, it'll probably be just a basic cable to get local channels, that kind of thing. Other than that, everything else is available online, and I, it's, it's far easier online. For Spoke TV, I'm Matt Howell. After the break, find out what type of therapy helps improve your immune system and respiratory system. Medical Oxygen Research, a Mississauga company, is making an impact on patient care using specialized hyperbaric oxygen therapy to help with complex wounds and the quality of life. Spoke TV's James Wells visited the tank to find out more. This big blue tank is a hyperbaric chamber. It's within this large blue chamber that patients receive oxygen therapy sessions. Oxygen as a therapy is that uh, it improves certain conditions uh, of compromised wounds, uh, of diabetic ulcers, uh, of uh, repairing and healing uh, of certain types of ear injuries. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a form of medical care that places patients into an environment that produces 100% oxygen gas. They then breathe it in and absorb it into their system. According to the owner of the hyperbaric facility, it's still within the adolescent stage here in Canada. It's, it's very limited in Canada. It's bigger in the States. They use it a lot in the States for vanity. Dave Bouchard, a type 2 diabetic, started his treatment just before Christmas. He was a little unsure at first about oxygen therapy. It's a scary looking thing. People have scrubs and helmets on and doctors and... Even though the chamber was intimidating at first, it did not frighten Dave away from receiving the recommended oxygen treatments. It's worked wonderfully. We've just finished 60 dives. The wound has gone from 11 inches to 7 inches in width and it's much smaller the other way too. After losing several toes to amputations, Dave encourages anyone to give hyperbaric oxygen therapy a chance. For Spoke TV, I'm James Wells. This week, I had the opportunity to meet personal trainer Josh Bauer, and he taught me how to perform a step up. I also made a healthy pancake that doesn't involve your typical pancake mix. Check it out. Welcome to Spoke Talks Health and Fitness with personal trainer Josh Bauer. This week, Ali Sieber Payton learns how to perform a step up, and she teaches you how to make a pancake with healthy substitutes. Today we're here with personal trainer Josh Bauer and he's going to tell us how to do a step up. So Josh, how are we going to go about this today? Alright, so what you're going to do is you're going to plant your lead foot forward and then step up and come back down. If you really want to make it more difficult, you can incorporate a lunge on your way back down. Perfect. Super neat Josh, so what are some of the benefits of this? Uh, some of the benefits include incorporating more balance and activating more of the glutes and the quadriceps. Awesome. And on behalf of Spoke TV, we want to thank you for being with us throughout the year. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, today I'll be showing you how to make pancakes with cottage cheese and oats. For this recipe, we used oats, baking powder, cottage cheese, cinnamon, two eggs, vanilla extract, and honey. First, pour half a cup of oats and half a cup of cottage cheese into the blender cup. Then, crack your eggs and add in one tablespoon of honey, one eighth teaspoon of cinnamon, one eighth teaspoon of baking powder, and a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. 
Blend together your mixture until there are no lumps. In a preheated pan, spray cooking oil and a small scoop of batter into the pan. When you start to see bubbles, it's time to flip. Cook until soft and moist. Put on a plate, serve and enjoy. Mm -mm -mm. It's been more than 10 years since Canada's food guide has been updated. Child obesity has tripled in the last decade. Spoke TV's Carla Buella looks into if there may be a link between our country's weight gain and its food guide. Canada's food guide is coming on the hit list as the country struggles with obesity rates that have doubled among adults and tripled among children since 1980. Critics are now asking for it to be changed. Although federal agencies said that they are reviewing the almost decade-old document, critics are still not at peace with the news. Kylie White, registered dietitian, said that food guide is not perfect but should not be blamed. Um, so increasing obesity may not necessarily be related to the food guide. Um, if anything, I think that the increasing obesity could more be related to people not understanding the food guide or not understanding how to eat in a healthy way. Um, having said that, the food guide isn't perfect and 10 years old is a little bit outdated now, so it probably is time for a little bit of a change. In 2005, 35% were measured as overweight and 24% as obese. But in 2008, 37 of Canadian adults were measured as overweight and 25% as obese. Even though Food Guide is studied heavily by experts, some of the changes could be done without looking too deep. Juice is right now on the Canada's Food Guide and half a cup of juice counts as a serving of fruits and vegetables. Um, but juice is really high in sugar and really low in fiber. So it's not necessarily, um, in my opinion, as healthy of a choice as something like eating a whole piece of fruit or eating some vegetables. Experts recommend instead a format that emphasizes eating fresh, whole foods and makes strong statements about limiting highly processed products. For Spoke TV, I'm Carla Buella. After the break, we take a look at a dark and eerie exhibit held at the Waterloo Region Museum. Gina's Closet is a place you can take dresses that aren't needed anymore. All proceeds, which are raised through others purchasing the dresses, go straight to cancer charities. Spoke TV's Alan Broadhagen has more. Dresses. A lot of dresses. Wedding dresses, uh, mother of the bride's dresses, prom dresses. All donated by women that don't need them anymore and all sold at a discount price for women who do. But that isn't why Gina's Closet is different from other retailers. Any money that we receive goes to one of six cancer charities. Marlene Bennett is the yes, co-founder of Gina's uh, Closet it's really important and started the store in memory of her late friend Gina who passed away because of cancer. Uh, Gina was uh, a recycler uh, long before it was popular, so uh, we were pleased with that and her husband and daughters think it's uh, great too. They're very, very supportive of what we're doing. Gina's Closet also sells accessories, with all proceeds, once again, going to cancer charities. All of us had been touched by cancer in some way. According to the Canadian Cancer website, two out of five Canadians are expected to develop cancer in their lifetime. She bought the dress and I told her the price and she said, no, I'm not going to pay that. And I said, you're not going to pay that. And she said, no, I'm going to pay more because I know the dress is worth more and I know it's going for a good cause. And so she did. With plans of moving to the main street in St. Jacobs, Gina's Closet may not have the same space it once had, but it will still have the same support from the community. For Spoke TV, I'm Alan Broadhagen. A Conestoga club put its paws together and hosted a prom for pups to raise money for Therapy Tales Ontario. Spoke TV's Kelly Golden brings us more from the event. Conestoga College Group, Conestoga in Action, or CIA for short, held their first ever prom for pups event on April the 8th. It was a nice way to end off the school year with drinks, food and dancing. This year's event was in support with Therapy Tales Ontario. President of CIA, Chris Hussey, explains how Conestoga in Action came up with the idea. It started as, the, as filling a bit of a void and saying, why don't we do a prom here at college? And it kind of evolved into a really great event, uh, as you can see here. Therapy Tales Ontario is a not-for-profit organization that has dogs going into schools, hospitals and rehab centers to have a positive impact on people's lives. Member of Therapy Tales Ontario, Justine Vole, shares the impact that therapy dogs have on students. 
much. I bring Winston in, even just to my office, like if I won't, we don't have a scheduled uh, therapy day for CSI, I'll just bring in my office and the amount of people I see that are like, oh my God, there's a dog, like, can I, can I pet your dog? Like they get so excited just to see him and it just, I think they forget about everything else that's going on and just like put their energy into something else. Yeah. This year was the first year that Conestoga in Action held the event, but hopefully it will continue in future years. For Spoke TV, I'm Kelly Golden. The Waterloo Region Museum is hosting an In the Dark exhibit where people can take a look at some eerie creatures that lurk in the dark. Spoke TV's Lindsay Griesbach finds her way through the dark and sheds light on this exhibit. The Waterloo Regional Museum is showcasing some critters and creatures that go bump in the night at its In the Dark exhibit. Carla Kale, the agricultural specialist at the museum, says it's been popular with kids. Um, this exhibit, I think, has been really interesting for a lot of people because it has so many things, uh, particularly in our deep sea area and in our caves, that people aren't overly familiar with. Uh, so the animals have been very popular, lots of people asking lots of questions about the animals that are featured in our exhibit. Um, there's also a lot of interactives, so touch screens where kids can explore, they can try uh, navigating as a star-nosed mole or as a pit viper. Um, so kids have really enjoyed those sorts of activities. Both she and Michaela Webster were excited to discuss their personal favorite parts of the exhibit. The favorite part of this exhibit is probably our cave. It's very interesting. There's lots of different creatures in there and you can play good games of I Spy with kids to try and find all the animals that we have in our case. Personal favorite is probably the giant bat head. Um, it gets the most interesting reactions from kids. Uh, they usually react a little bit terrified because it is a very large bat head. Um, so we'll go over and sort of pet its head and then they get more curious and come over and explore it. In addition to the interactive exhibit, the interpreters hold scheduled events with kids every half hour that range from learning about fireflies to echolocation in both bats and deep sea creatures. The In the Dark display is a traveling museum exhibit rented from the States. Next month, it will be replaced by a local exhibit celebrating Kitchener's 100th naming anniversary after it was changed from Berlin. The last chance to test your skills and courage in the dark is May 8th. This exhibit is a great way to teach kids and adults about normally feared animals such as snakes, owls, and bats. For Spoke TV, I'm Lindsay Griesbach. When we come back, we find out about a 17-year-old shot put athlete who is making her way to the national championships. Earlier this week, I sat down with Spoke TV's own Peter Scott, who gave a breakdown of what to look out for in this year's 2016 NHL playoffs, as well as predictions of this year's Stanley Cup winner. Hi there, I'm Megan Spotswood and welcome to a special edition of Spoke's NHL Preview Playoffs. I'm here with uh, sports analyst Peter Scott today and I guess today we're going to start kicking it off with uh, the NHL playoffs being on their way. We're going to start off with Florida versus the New York Islanders. So uh, the Islanders have some injuries in their lineup, so do you think that this is a setback for them? Well I think it obviously can affect them a lot because they are missing uh, Yaroslav Halak who's their starting goalie B. So that could be effective, but I think I don't think it'll be as big of an issue as it could be. I think it'll be more about Florida's depth up front. I think Florida's going to take this series in uh, five or six games. Awesome. So uh, let's move on to uh, the next series, uh, Tampa Bay Lightning versus uh, the Detroit Red Wings. What do you think about that? I see Tampa just being too fast. To, and I think that they'll just win this series. I think I have them winning in six. All right, Washington versus uh, Philadelphia. What are your predictions for this series? I just think, honestly, Washington's just too much, I mean, too much for Philadelphia's defense to handle. So, yeah, I'm thinking that uh, Washington's probably yeah. going to have this one. How about you? I think Steve Mason might steal one for Philly, but I have Washington in five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next series, uh, we got Pittsburgh Penguins versus the New York Rangers. Again, two really strong and tough teams with really strong players. I just think that Pittsburgh has, is going to win this series. I have them winning in seven. And uh, how about we get into the West Division playoffs now? Um, we're going to start off with uh, Dallas Stars and the Minnesota Wild. One thing that's going to come down to Dallas' success is their goaltending. The combination of Antti Niemi and Kari Lettinen was not good this year. They only combined for a 904 save percentage and a 2.78 goals against average. Those are both bottom half in the league. So if Dallas wants to finish the year with a cup, they need their Finnish goalies to step up and play well in these playoffs. Uh, all right, so next uh, uh, series we have St. Louis uh, Blues versus the Chicago Blackhawks. This is definitely going to be a tough round for sure. What are your yeah, predictions? Yeah, I think this is the toughest first round series. Uh, I think a lot of skill, a lot of speed, but I think Chicago, I think Chicago will be too much to handle. And if St. Louis does fall in the first round, look for Ken Hitchcock to get the axe. 
Um, okay, so next uh, series is going to be uh, Anaheim versus the Nashville Predators. Uh, what are your predictions for that series? Pekka Rene is usually known for one of the top echelon goalies in the league, but had a really rough year this year. He had his worst save percentage over a full season and the second worst goals against average. So Nashville's going to need him and their defense to really play up to how we know they're capable of flying for them to have a chance. I definitely, I definitely agree with you. So the next series is um, LA Kings versus the San Jose Sharks. Now I know for sure that this is going to be a great series. Um, so what's been going on with these two teams? The LA Kings, they're just a big, bad, bruising team. Lucic fit in really well with a good bounce back year, scoring 55 points. They're going to be too strong for San, for San Jose to handle, who's also coming back to the playoffs after missing it one year. San Jose's got a very balanced lineup, 520 goal scores, and that doesn't even include Joe Thornton, who led the team in scoring this year. Yeah, definitely a seven, uh, seven game series. Yeah. So um, for the West and the East, who do you think is going to make it to the Stanley Cup Finals? Well, so for the Eastern Conference, I have um, Washington going up against Florida. And I think though President Trophy winners don't normally fare well in the playoffs, I, have, I think Washington, this is the year they can finally do it. I have Washington winning in the East. And then the West, I have, uh, I have Anaheim going up against Chicago. Anaheim lost at a heartbreaker last year in Chicago in seven games. This year I have them getting their revenge and it'll be an Anaheim-Washington Cup final. And who do you think is going to win it all? I think uh, Washington is going to win the Cup in six. I finally think Ovechkin will get his Cup. I think that they've just been so dominant throughout the entire year. They haven't really slowed down and I just think it's their, this is their Cup to lose essentially. Brantford's track and field club is a growing success. Holly Taylor is a 17-year-old national title holder for shot put and weight throw. Her coach has been a major part of her success. Spoke TV's Stefan Singh has more. That is the sound of success for Holly Taylor. The 17-year-old is a national champion in both shot put and weight throw, which is an indoor version of hammer throw. I was watching your shoulders. They were not, they were, you were closed long. Holly's coach and Brantford Track and Field Club Vice President Sean Doucette knows how hard she works every day. But I think what makes her good at, at track and field is drive. Like it's hard work. Hard work, you know, beats, they say it beats talent, but her hard work is second to none. She's dedicated to the sport. Holly was an exceptional hockey player and didn't know that she was going to get noticed as a track and field athlete. The distance coach from the Brantford Track and Field Club approached me after I had won Kwasa in shot put. And he told me that there was a coach at the club that would um, like to have me as a thrower. Cole Beckwell from Kitchener also trains with Doucette and is now a top contender in his age category. It's just really, uh, really satisfying as a coach to have, have successful athletes. Holly is getting lots of attention from universities. Her mom, Sue, says Holly is always dedicated to achieving success. It's them out there alone, no teammates to help them claim a victory so it's just interesting to to watch them do things on their own. Holly Taylor will be looking to perform well in Brantford to qualify for Kwasa and then off the West which is being held here at Jacob Hesper in Cambridge. For Spoke TV, I'm Stefan Singh. That's all we have for you today. I'm Megan Spotswood. And I'm Ali Sierra Payton. For more news and information visit SpokeTV.ca or follow us on Twitter. I'm really excited to graduate.